Well, thank you all for joining us today for the benefits of beelines for local authorities. Um, I shall just share my screen and then I'll talk about what we're going to be doing today. If you bear with me a second. Apologies for the slight delay. I'll be with you in a second. So I find my PowerPoint. Okay, I'll try that again. So share screen. Here we are. So hopefully you can all see that. So welcome to the benefits of Beelines for Local Authorities. Um, so we've already had Emily talk to us about housekeeping and I'm Kareen Varhead, I'm England manager for Bug Life. And the session today will basically be, I'll give a very short introduction to Bug Life in a moment. And then Rachel Richards, our Beelines officer, will talk to you about Beelines guidance for local authorities. Um, I'll briefly talk about some of the policy drivers behind um, using beelines and the use of beelines for local authorities. And then we've got some case studies of how beelines have actually been used by local authorities. So at 10.30, we have Jane Ashford, uh, Nat Natural Infrastructure Officer at Plymouth City Council, talking about how beelines have been adopted in Plymouth. Um, at 10.45, we have our own Kate Jones, who is a conservation officer at Bug Life, talking about our Get the Marches Buzzing project, uh, which has involved working closely with Telford City Council and others. Um, and then at 11, Tanya St. Pierre, um, will, who is in the Grassland and Pollinators team leader uh, at Cumbrian Wildlife Trust, will be talking about some the ways beelines have been adopted in her region. And then at the end, we'll have time for a short Q&A. So, first of all, Bug Life. Hopefully you're all familiar and members of Bug Life. Uh, Bug Life is the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. It's the only organisation dedicated to the conservation of all invertebrates and their habitats. We have many programmes of activities, but obviously our, we're mainly dedicated to halting the decline in invertebrates and that involves basically enhancing habitats for invertebrates and species focused work on invertebrates together with a whole load of other stuff so some of our main programs include beelines and rachel will be telling you about beelines shortly we also have a focus on species recovery we have some species specific um, focused projects uh, working with natural england at the moment for example on a suite of um, species recovery projects Important invertebrate areas are another important strand. These, as their name suggests, identify areas of the country which are hotspots for rare inver invertebrates. Um, Wales has been fine scale mapped in terms of our important invertebrate areas, and we're just in the middle of fine scale mapping England. Um, and this provides very useful information when you're looking at areas which should be a priority for conservation. Site protection is another thing that Bug Life does, um, along with advocacy and policy and general outreach and engagement. So I'll hand over now to Rachel Richards to tell you more specifically about our Beelines programmes and how they can be useful to local authorities um, in helping you achieve your um, conservation aims. I will unmute, that'd be helpful. Thank you, Karim, that was great. Just gonna share my screen.
So all these bars getting in the way of my screen. Slideshow. Okay, can you see that okay? Yeah, brilliant, okay. Um, so I'm Rachel Richards, I'm Beeline's Officer for Bug Life. I'm just trying to get it to move onto the next slide. There we go, excellent. Um, so this is the, the basic structure of my talk today. The importance of pollinators, the problems that they face, uh, beelines a solution, how we can support beelines, and then of course the new guidance resources. Um, so obviously invertebrates have their own intrinsic value and beauty. Um, they bring health and well-being benefits to ourselves, um, but they also perform vital ecosystem services. So um, pollination services that they're well known for, also integrated pest management. So having that right balance of pests and predators that helps to keep potentially pest species under control. They're food for other wildlife. So they're the base of the food chain. Um, and they also carry out things like nutrient cycling. They help to control water retention in the soil to reduce flooding. They aerate the soil and they reduce the need for inputs. So they bring so many benefits to ecosystems. Well, they're essential, they're the, a base of ecosystems. Um, they're very well known for their, the importance, their pollination services. So eight out of 10 bark plants need insect pollinators um, and one in three mouthfuls of food depend on pollination. Um, and there's a monetary value to it as well because 84% of EU crops rely on insect pollination. So there's a big cost to that. And in the UK, that's 690 million it's been calculated at. So looking after those healthy invertebrate pollinator assemblages is really important. Um, so they'll increase the yield, but also the crop stability and the quality of um, the crop that's produced when you have healthy invertebrate populations pollinating crops. Um, so pollinators are not just honeybees, not just bumblebees, but a whole assemblage of different invertebrates. So there's at least 4,000 species involved in pollination in the UK. Um, we have around 270 species of bee, 25 bumblebees, 250 solitary bees, 270 hoverflies. So a lot more species than a lot of people realize, um, which are all contributing to pollination and need particular habitats and resources to do well. So what are the problems they're facing? I'll try not to go into this too much. We're often we're all aware of this, um, but there's been 33% invertebrate declines identified in last year's State of Nature report in the species that they looked at. Um, so more than two thirds of pollinating insects were found to be declining by CEH just a, a few years ago. Um, so the Bugs Matter survey is a citizen science survey. Um, that Bug Life run. Anybody can take part. There's an app you can download on your phone in the summer months. You clean your number plate, start the app, um, and the app logs your journey. And at the end, you take a photo of your number plate and it gives you um, the splatter count of what you've hit. Um, and I think we've all noticed over the years, uh, you know, when I was younger, windscreens would be filthy in the summer after a drive. And that isn't happening as much because there is this decline in abundance of invertebrates. 80% of butterfly species declined since the 1970s. That was bumblebee conservation study. And 20 bee and wasp species have gone extinct in the last century. So these, these are worrying figures. Um, so this is a well-known study you might have come across um, in 2017 on a German nature reserve over 25 years, a 75% decline in abundance. So that's a site that is being managed well for nature. So it just shows that the declines are wider um, than just where habitat is being lost. So what's the problem? Um, 97% of species rich wildflower habitat lost. And, you know, looking at that picture there, 
Um, so some of that, much of that is to do with agricultural changes. So not so much the fault of the farmers, but what we've told them to do since the war in terms of producing more, intensifying bigger fields, taking out the hedgerows, bigger machinery, more inputs. Um, obviously, that has come at a cost um, to the environment. And those practices are slowly changing. There's a lot of good farming practices going on now. Fragmentation of habitat um, through many for many reasons, um, from farming, from development, from roads. There's a lot of um, pressures on our land, um, but also untargeted, diffused delivery. Um, so bits and pieces here and there, um, and it's a case of trying to join that up. Um, and as you see in this picture, poor management in some instances of public green spaces. This is in Northern Wales last summer, um, and our summers are getting hotter. Our green spaces are getting browner unless we change the way that we manage them. So obviously in this area, there, there's some ball games in the center there. You want a short area for ball games, but there's a lot of opportunities potentially to have longer flowery margins. So you've also got the habitat there for wildlife, also something that would stop your ball from rolling on the road and causing accidents. So we need more, bigger, better, and more connected areas for wildlife as stated in the Making Space for Nature report. So solutions, let's get on from the problems onto the solutions. There's so many opportunities. Um, we need to make landscapes work better for pollinators and other wildlife. We want more permanent connected flowerage habitats like those images there. We want to increase the size and the quality of habitat. We want things like habitat mosaics. So not just a field of flowers, but scrub, um, ponds, variety of habitat. Um, and yeah, just that those micro habitats that invertebrates and so many other um, creatures need. So you want the diversity of habitat type um, and we want to make the landscape more permeable. Um, by that we mean um, connected up. So a lot of small invertebrates, if you think of some of the solitary bees, they'll only travel a couple of hundred meters. Um, so if you have um, a lovely little site for invertebrates with, with lots of great populations, something happens there, there's a fire or, you know, some, something destroys that site. How will that site recolonize if the nearest other piece of habitat is two kilometers away? So you want stepping stones of habitat so the populations um, can recolonize sites and move around the landscape. So bee lines, um, bee lines is a great solution to this. Bee lines is a network of three kilometer wide corridors connecting the best um, remaining flower rich habitats in the UK. Um, so it's a directed focus to national flower rich habitat creation. It's an attempt to reverse pollinator declines um, and it's a resource for everyone to contribute to. It's not ours, it's a shared resource. So it's for local authorities, NGOs, businesses, schools, landowners, homeowners in your gardens. <clears throat> so the, the basic principles within each county of the UK, there's a roughly east-west, roughly north-south bead line. Um, and within those, the aim is, um, it would be lovely if it was solid habitat for three kilometers, but obviously there are, there are roads, there are businesses, there is active um, farmland. Um, so what we're looking at really is having stepping stones of habitat within that three kilometer corridor, um, moving towards 10% of that being filled. In some parts of the country, places like Salisbury Plain, um, that's already over the 10%, but we're aiming for all of the lines to, to be filled with 10% habitat stepping stones um, to encompass the best and the majority of wildflower rich habitats, especially grassland. Um, and where possible, when those areas can be large, over two hectares, um, that, that holds larger, more stable populations of invertebrates and other wildlife. And of course, it's not just for pollinators. We've got skylarks and lizards there as well. Other species that love grassland that need invertebrates um, to feed on as well. So what benefits invertebrates inven benefits so much more. And of course, people as well. You know, we all enjoy having that green space that we can access. It's great for our well-being. So this is this is how Bee Lines was developed around the table in each county. Um, the principles were based on research by Liverpool University. So there was a lot of statistics and modeling involved. Um, and as I said, it's restoring those stepping stones of habitat in linear corridors rather than diffused um, 
habitat work all over the place. Obviously, there's a lot of habitat between bee lines as well, but where possible, we're focusing as much of it as possible in bee lines. So we, we use local data and local expertise. So these people around the table in this particular workshop will be local NGOs, local naturalists, um, local authorities, people that know the area, the habitats and the species in their area, and using the data of where designated sites already are, um, but also looking at um, you know, undesignated sites as well and how that can be best be connected up. So these people were deciding where to put the bee lines. So um, in September, last September, there were almost 3,000 dots on the map. There's a lot more work going on out there which isn't on the map. Um, so we're just encouraging people as well to put their own work on the map. Um, and that's over 3,500 hectares of wildflower work, which is fantastic. This just shows where we have active bee lines projects at the moment. Um, so you can see we've got a couple in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, um, one on the Scottish English borders and just sort of through, throughout the country there. Um, so if you live in any of those areas, um, do check our website and get involved if you can. Um, and this is how you would add your work, be it work that you're doing with your local authority or in your garden or with a community group. Um, if you have a wildflower meadow, a pollinator friendly um, flower bed or, you know, balcony, um, pond, anything like that, you can stick it onto the map here. You go onto our website um, under our work, find bee lines, and there's a map, an interactive map at the bottom there. So you can zoom in, um, find your, your field or your road verge. Um, and just click on add site and a little form comes up there, you put all your details on there. And it's a great way of just motivating people in your local area by showing them what you're doing and encourage other people to do the same. So finally, uh, um, the new guidance resources. So these are on our website um, under beelines and pollinator advice. Um, so we have, let me just move people's pictures up. I think you've got muted, Rachel. Okay, can you hear me again? That's better. Sorry. Do you know what I did? I was moving my pictures out of the way. Um, <laughs> so the, the benefits of Beeline's resource there, that's the, the first resource. I don't know if you heard me saying where they are. So they're on our website um, under Beeline's and under Pollinator advice. Um, so the benefits of bee lines is about how bee lines can help you meet your environmental commitments. Um, then we've got managing road verges, which is self-explanatory, um, managing parks and green spaces, um, and managing community spaces. That last one there is to give to community groups with lots of ideas and advice there. Um, and of course, we have case studies as well. So the people on the call here today are contributing to case studies. If you're doing work that you, you would like to go into a case study as well, that'd be fantastic. We're always looking for more, so drop me an email. Um, but they cover lots of basic principles that many of you are, will already be aware of about managing green spaces for pollinators and other wildlife. Um, so things like reducing the cuttings, um, removing those cuttings when you do cut um, wherever possible so that you're keeping nutrient levels low for wildflowers. Um, methods of creating wildflower rich areas and the best ways of doing that, you know, using seed and plants of local provenance or even green hay, if you can, or brush harvested seed. Um, talk of which plants and trees and shrubs um, are good for pollinators, but also um, it talks about nesting habitats, so the ground nesting area or nesting bees um, and other invertebrates and features like ponds and scrapes and scrub, so other features. Um, which are of value. So of course, it's not just the pollen resources, but it's the nesting, it's the whole life cycle of our invertebrates that we need to think about. One second. Oh, I think I missed a slide. Here we go. So um, the benefits of bee lines. So you'll find these six key actions in the benefits of bee lines resource. So just to go through them very quickly, um, these are things that local authorities can do to support bee lines in your area. Um, so do have a look at the bee lines map and see where it is in your area. 
and try and prioritize, um, you know, where there's a choice between off or on bee lines um, to do work within bee lines to create and enhance and manage green space as well. Um, ensure that local wildlife sites and nature reserves um, are managed in a favorable condition. Obviously, we'd love to do that with all of our wildlife sites, but where there's a choice, again, try and prioritize bee lines so we have that connectivity on bee lines. Review the management of green infrastructure. So, you know, look at those green areas and how you're managing and which areas you might be able to reduce the cuts on or enhance with, with seed or manage in a slightly different way. Um, and create wildflower rich areas in parks, school grounds, roundabouts, car parks, you know, wherever the, there's a little bit of a, a green space, bring some flowers in, bring some resources in that are going to be beneficial to the locals as well as the wildlife, of course. Um, and encourage local people to manage um, green spaces and community areas better. And that, that resource is very helpful for that, the managing community spaces. And then if you haven't already, create or adopt a pollinator strategy with your local authority and, and get bee lines in there as well. Okay, well, I think that's me. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Rachel. And I'll just um, mention some benefits to uh, local authorities of adopting key lines. So the policy drivers for local authorities, um, hopefully you're familiar with the national pollinator strategy. Now, while that's not a policy, it is a sort of national guidance document on pollinators. Um, local authorities are key in the delivery of this. Uh, it's a 10 year strategy. So interestingly, it is due for a new renewal this year, though I haven't actually heard anything about the latest update of it. Uh, they might leave that to the next government to sort out. Um, then there's a the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act of 2006. Um, local authorities have a duty to conserve and enhance biodiversity. Um, that's a strong message from um, that act. Um, the NERC Act involves the Section 41 list of species and habitats um, to which we have to pay special attention. Then there's a national planning policy framework. Uh, the importance of conserving natural capital and ecosystem services is very much a part of that. Um, and it also mentions the importance of coherent ecological networks. Now, obviously, the idea of a coherent ecological network very much underpins our beeline. So that's one way of achieving that very important aim. Then there's the Environment Act of 2021. Uh, which aims to reverse declines of species by 2030. And within that, we have local nature recovery um, strategies, um, which I'm sure a lot of local authorities are working on at this moment. And also encompassed within that is biodiversity net gain, where planning um, is used to achieve a 10% increase in biodiversity. And again, this is something which very much impinges upon local authorities through planning. So that's just a quick uh, recap of some of the policy drivers behind, um, behind the value of adopting um, the bee lines framework and how, as Rachel said, the numerous ways in which bee lines can actually be used to help local authorities actually address some of these um, policy commitments. So going back to our schedule for the day, um, our next speaker is Jane Ashford, Natural Infrastructure Officer at Plymouth City Council, to talk about some of the ways in which bee lines have been used in uh, Plymouth City. So. Are you ready, Jane? Yeah, thank you very much. I'll just uh, make sure I find the right screen to share. Okay. Then we all see that. I'm going to take silence as a positive. Um, okay, hello. Uh, my name is Jane Ashford. I'm a Natural Infrastructure Officer with Plymouth City Council. Um, 
I am here to talk to you today about our grass cutting policy and our urban meadows campaign. Plymouth City Council has been increasing the amount of wildflowers in the city since 2012, um, but COVID really helped us accelerate the reduction in grass cutting. Um, and during COVID, we, we let 1,300 grass areas grow long across our city. That was a massive success. Um, residents really engaged in the longer grass, the increased wildflowers and increased um, insect life within their, in close to their homes. Um, and it led us to formalize a 60-40 policy. So now what we do is we manage 60% of the grass for people and 40% of the grassland for nature. So in the image you can see on the screen there, you can see a road, uh, a road verge. We've, there's about, I think there's six lanes of traffic on that road. So it's not a place you wanna sit and picnic. It's not a place you wanna be playing ball, uh, ball games. So it's a perfect bit of grass to leave for nature which is what's happened there. Um, we've got a edge, a one machine's width cut next to the pavement, next to any road to stop any vegetation growing onto, the, onto those areas and getting in the way. But it also provides a really lovely barrier, um, a, a proof that this area is being maintained. So in the public eye, it's not just being neglected, it is an area being maintained. You can see that edge is cut there um, and the fact that it's managed for nature. So we've got three possible options that any one piece of grass could have to it. One is a complete cut. These are areas that are managed for people um, like sports pitches, so they get cut regularly. The other is an edge cut. So that's an area that just has its edges cut. And then once a year, the central long section would get cut and dropped. And then we have a wildlife meadow. Um, and those areas are very similar to an edged area. So they still have their edges uh, maintained, but they're cut and baled at the end of the year or cut and collected at the end of the year. The aim of this is very similar to what Rachel was saying. Um, we've lost 97% of our wildflowers since 1930. We want to protect and enhance biodiversity with the Lawton principle, that bigger, better and more joined up. Grassland is incredible to be able to join up areas so we've got nature reserves we've got woodlands but our um, grass verges along main roads are a great way of connecting as as corridors um it can help with a climate emergency because the less you cut the less fuel you need um in the cutting machinery um, and again it has massive benefits for nature connectedness for our local residents this is a little um, screenshot into the behind the scenes working in the council. This is a, a screenshot from our digital asset system, Alloy. Um, we now have every single, we hope, <laughs> every single grass area in the city digitized. Um, my last count, which was April-ish, we had was 13,000 grass areas. Um, we have, again, we have uh, um, COVID and lockdown to thank for the time to be able to do that work. Um, as you can tell, digitizing that many polygons took um, a long time. We, the screenshot you've got there is, is Plymouth Ho um, with Smeaton's Tower. You may be familiar with it. Um, it's a really busy area for, uh, for people, socializing, tourism, events. So that large grass area, that pink bit that's colored in pink needs to be cut and maintained regularly. That's what the pink color is saying, that that area of grass is cut regularly. Um, there are blue polygons on there. Those are the ones that we we edge. And then the red ones with the little trefoils are the ones that are wildlife meadows. If you click on any one of these polygons, you can get a huge amount of information about the grass. So I've clicked on one here in this screenshot and um, the kind of green one that's highlighted in the center of the image. And the banner on the side tells you the information we've got on that area. So each grass area has its own identifier. This one, what's this one? 40773. Um, it tells you what its cut type is. So this one is an edged area with the edges cut regularly and the center left and cut and dropped once a year. It tells you what ward it's in, what neighborhood it's in. And then it gives us a whole load of more options that could be ticked or not ticked. Um, the most interesting thing about this particular grass area is that it's got the tick next to banked. That tells us that that particular bit of grass is steeper than 15 degrees. Now that means that it needs to be cut with a specialist piece of equipment. We wouldn't cut that with a ride on mower or a pedestrian mower. We'd cut that with a remote controlled mower for safety. 
Um, it would also tell us other risk assessments based on the traffic conditions on uh, next to the road there, or um, or again, how steep it is. This asset management system is really helpful because we can send jobs, or we do send jobs to operatives on the ground. So if I was tasked with cutting that grass area, I, as the operative, would look at my phone, I'd see that I had a job, I'd see the, the grassed area that needed cutting, and I'd be able to see which cut type it is. So I would know that only the edges of that shape need cutting with my remote controlled mower. I could go out and do that. And once I'd completed the job, I would sign it off on my phone, which goes into the background system of, of Alloy, um, and records against the grassed area the last time it was cut and by who. That gives us a huge amount of information that we have in our system, that, um, that we know how we're managing our grass. It helps to answer complaints. Um, yeah, it can be really, really helpful. So again, this data is slightly out of date now. I last did it in April, um, but this we can be really specific about total hectares that we've got in what cut type. So you can see our complete cut type, which is what is managed for people, the kind of sports pitches, etc. Um, 90, oh, what's that? 58% of our grassed area is managed for people, um, about 340 hectares. Edged areas is our smallest percentage. 16% um, of our area, of our grass is, is edged and then cut and dropped once a year. And then 27-ish percent of our grassland areas is wildlife meadow, which is where we cut and bale or cut and remove once a year. We have a contractor that does the cutting and, uh, and removing for us. They're based just outside of the city boundaries um, and they compost all of the arisings that they collect. So all of the arising they collect out of the city's grass and um, they compost in their facility and that makes a usable compost product, um, which is a really lovely um, loop. Challenges. Um, as I suggested, digitizing all of those grassed areas was a huge challenge. No single point of truth existed beforehand, so there was no map to copy. It's been completely reliant on aerial images and local knowledge. Um, we're still missing some. We pick up small areas that we haven't digitized as we go along, um, but we're, we're getting there now. Mindsets, they are the biggest challenge. That's both internal to the council and external. Um, the traditional view about grassland has been that short cut grass is neat and tidy, well maintained, whereas a long grassland area is neglected. So it's changing that mindset to get people to consider the benefits of long grass. Another challenge is the knock on consequences to other parts of the council. So the once a year when we're cutting our long grass and leaving it, that grass can get into the street verges, can get into um, drains. So our street sweeping team need to be made aware of when we're starting that cut and need to um, alter their patterns. Our machinery has also been used traditionally for cutting grass every two weeks. So nice short grass, easy to cut, um, which means when we try and get the same machinery to cut grass, that has been growing for a whole year and um, it can cause damage to it. Solutions. So first external solutions. Um, we've worked with loads of partners. The Devon Wildlife Trust, Bug Life and Devon and Somerset Fire and Rescue have been really helpful to add validity to our approach um, and make sure that it's safe. We've engaged with the public in a, in a campaign um, quite heavily. We've put quite a lot of time into this. So we've got an online map. The Alloy system allows us to be able, we basically share that map publicly. So if you are a resident and down the end of your street with a bit of grass that doesn't look like it's being cut, you could go onto this map, find your bit of grass in question and work out what um, cutting policy it is meant to be. So if it wasn't being cut, you had a look at it, you found out it was a wildflower meadow due to be bailed at the end of the year. We've got 60 wooden signs around the city made by Plymouth University of Arts students. Um, and we've got seven of these road signs you can see in the image there, and they're placed at prominent exit and entrance points um, in and out of the city. We then run um, a comms campaign. So we've got press releases um, and about eight videos where I'm sat in various road verges um, around the city, pointing at different plants. Um, last time I looked at those, again, a while ago now, 20, uh, 25,000 views. Um, of me sat in these um, 
parts of Plymouth and I'm kind of just highlighting what can be found in the general um, road verge so birds with trefoil and even just different species of grass and the benefits of having more than one species of grass growing. We've had about 79% of the comments left were positive which was really incredible and what's re also really lovely is that um, the general public are being self-policing so negative ones are being responded to um, in a quite a constructive way um, explaining the benefits of long grass which is really lovely. Solutions um, internally, we've run biodiversity training for our grass cutting operatives. So Devon Wildlife Trust and the Devon Biodiversity Record Centre um, came along for a day. Um, it was lovely. Our street operatives were looking in quadrats, prancing around with uh, bug nets. Um, and we compared a wildlife meadow managed for nature and a sports pitch. You can see them sat in here that is cut regularly. And we just compared biodiversity in the two sites and really highlighted uh, the positive work that they were doing in managing the grass. We run appreciative inquiry sessions with the workforce um, to really understand their views about their jobs and um, what it's like on the front line. Carbon literacy introductions um, and most importantly, I think, is an annual grass cutting review. Every team has a chance to feed back into this annual review. Um, they might ask us, why is it that they have to cut the grass on this side, but not on the other side of the road? Um, and that probably is just an oversight when we've been digitizing from aerial images and, and we can make that alteration. They might also notice that an area of grass we're now growing long used to have an informal desire line through it that people can't walk through anymore. Uh, and based on that, we can alter our grass cutting policy, add um, a strip of grass that's cut to allow that to, to continue. Next steps, uh, even more staff training for wider than the teams that are cutting the grass, but anybody else, so people answering the phone lines, for example. I would love to do much wider biodiversity monitoring. We've got um, Plymouth University master's students that have collected some um, data, run projects on it, to kind of um, prove in small locations the benefits that it's having. But I would love to be able to monitor the whole city somehow. Um, I have kind of a idea about grass cutting operatives collecting species richness data um, before they cut the grass uh, watch this space annual grass cutting reviews so every single year we collect the views of the operatives on the ground we um, approach the local councillors and we have a form that's live on our website throughout the year that local residents can make suggestions about changes in their area um, and about this time of year we're busy reviewing all of that information and making the changes ready for next year we need to reflect on our current equipment usage. So our um, mowers at the moment are rotary decks and we're going to we're changing those or some of those into a flail deck, which is stronger and better at cutting longer grass. Um, and we're going to continue baling our wildlife areas. Every single time we bale the grass, we're removing the nutrients and improving the quality for wildflowers. So just continuing to do that will improve the quality of our habitats. Um, now, this work could not be possible without a huge amount of partners um, that the council's worked with um, over a great number of years. So um, many thanks to all of those. And I don't know if we've got time for questions, um, but I'm here to answer them if we do. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, Jane. We'll have our main Q&A uh, session at the end. So we'll save our uh, main questions for that. But actually, as it happens, uh, we do have three spare minutes before Kate Jones's schedule to start. So we could squeeze in a cheeky question. Um, I'll just choose a random one. Well, I'll choose one from the top of the Q&As. We actually had a lot of questions, both in the chat and in the Q&As. Um, if you could, for future sessions, stick your questions in the Q&A, then they'll all be in one place and we'll have a Q&A session right at the end. So a very Quick question. Um, so a question from Richard Palmy uh, for Jane. Where you cut and drop, how does that go down with local people and how does it affect the area? Are there concerns about appearance, fire risk and smothering of plants beneath the cut long grass? 
Okay. Uh, how does it go down with local residents? Um, our comms campaign has really worked on engaging local residents with the benefits of long grass um, whilst it's there. Um, everybody, I think it's appreciated that the grass gets cut once a year, um, again, so that it feels managed, um, that it's not just left, kind of, uh, perception would be if you leave it, it might feel abandoned. Um, fire risk of cutting the long grass and leaving it there, we're cutting it at the end of the season, so we're talking um, uh, September, October time. So there's not a great deal of risk. Uh, Plymouth is very wet, <laughs> so it's, it's not the it's it's not one of our main risks at that time of year to cut and drop that long grass. Um, there are we have worked with the fire and rescue department to consider the risks of fire um, within an urban area. It's not something they've done much work on, so it's actually a really interesting thing to keep keep working with them on. Um, but that's more mid season in the summer than at the end. hope that answers the question oh that's great and i think we'll leave the other questions for the q a session at the end but thanks to everyone who posted questions there's been a lot of interest from your talk jane so we'll uh make you busy later <laughs> on okay. um, so now kate are you ready to talk to us about your get the marches buzzing project and how you've worked with your local council there yes uh i'll share my screen Hang on. Um, is that that's got all my notes and everything oh no you just need to go to full screen that's it right there we go it's going to um i've put it in presenter view so i'm just checking that you can still see my full screen yeah i can see your full Great. screen Great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, great to see. I've just been watching the chat whilst people have been talking. And great to see that so many people from all over the place are here, uh, including somebody from the Isle of Wight and a few people from Shropshire, which is where I'm based. Um, I, my name is Kate Jones. I'm a conservation officer at Bug Life and I lead on the Get the Marches Buzzing project. I work with Emily Hughes, who was introduced at the start of this. Emily is the intern on the project. So together um, we're running this and it we're basically developing habitat along the bee lines through Shropshire and North Herefordshire, uh, 60 hectares in total over two years. Um, I've got to say a big thank you to our funders. It wouldn't be possible uh, without our funders. Our two main funders are the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Seven Trent. Um, but we've also had support from Telford and Regan Council, Milky Way, the Edward Cadbury Charitable Trust and the Millichip Foundation. Um, so I'm here to talk about our work with Telford and Regan Council. So although our project spreads across Shropshire and North Herefordshire, we have worked with Telford and Regan Council for a few years now in a previous project as well. And we've got a nice kind of almost self-encompassed little project within the bigger project with, with Telford and Regan. Um, got a really good working relationship with them. And uh, yeah, we're achieving um, some quite exciting stuff, I, I think, with them. So just an overview of the talk. Um, I'll chat a little bit about the habitat restoration that we're, that we're doing with the council. Um, how it dovetails in with their approach to green space management, um, how that work is contributing to protecting their priority species, particularly the dingy butterfly, and how those projects have been integrated into communities um, so that we're working with like local people, local businesses, schools, and other charities as well. Um, I should also mention that we've got Richard Shaw, who's the environmental community li liaison officer for Telford Reading Council on. Uh, so I might throw to him later if there's any questions specifically for Telford and Regan Council. And I believe Ben Holloway is also here, who's their biodiversity technician. So our habitat restoration and enhancement. So as well as species rich grass and work that we're doing that we've been talking about uh, in, in the presentations beforehand, we're also doing a lot of uh, restoration of open mosaic habitat. So what's really special about Telford is um, comes from its industrial past, really. And there's lots of really biodiverse, biodiverse uh, sites 
that are on old uh, soil heaps or mining areas um, that have a really interesting uh, habitat structure. So we're doing 8.6 hectares of open mosaic habitat restoration and 4.4 hectares of species rich grass and restoration. We've also worked with them on putting in some urban features into communities. So we've done a, a pollinator garden in one of the town parks and we installed some wild uh, nectar and pollen rich wildflower beds uh, on Dawley High Street. Those dots there, the, those are our project sites. So the green dots are the sites that we worked on as part of 7B Lines, which was a project that started in 2021. Uh, and was a green recovery challenge project. And then the red dots are the sites that we're working on as part of Get the Marches Buzzing. Uh, and you can start to see that we're, yeah, we're making inroads into that B line and how it um, dovetails in with Telford and Rican's green spaces as well is what we have here is their designated local nature reserve network. And you can start to see we're already working on one of those, two of those. Um, and you can start to see that that's building up quite a nice connectivity network within the B-Line. They're proposed local nature reserves and we're working on one of those, which I'll talk about later. And then we've got their green guarantee sites where I've done a major oversight here and made them yellow, should have made them green. Um, but these are sites that don't have any formal designations. A lot of them are amenity grassland areas, um, but the council have committed to protecting them from development and ensuring that they remain as green space. Uh, and they're going through a process at the moment of reviewing the um, annual mowing regimes and changing a lot of these from some of them from like a 16 mow and drop regime to one cut and collect per year and we're helping on a couple of those sites by um, using our project funding to inject a bit of species diversity with some locally harvested seed uh, which I'll talk about later. So the open mosaic habitat, I'll move on to, I'll just chat quickly about one of the sites, Manor Road Pit Mound. Uh, it's a small site, it's about four hectares in size. Um, again, an, an, an old uh, spoil heap from Telford's industrial past. Um, the main thing that had happened to this site is abandonment. And that's um, a big issue with, with these sites. Um, it's got heather present, it's got uh, some acid oak woodland present on it. Um, it's it's a really lovely site, an area of uh, grass, but it was just becoming uh, a bit inundated with with scrub and uh, dominated uh, by certain species, specifically gorse. Um, so we just come in there and basically introduced a bit of structural diversity um, by doing woodland thinning, tree felling, opening up around the heather, um, focusing on spots that will have a big impact on, on invertebrate populations. So this south facing bank here. Um, this is the cap of the mound, uh, which had tiny bits of heather hanging on in the middle of this dense stand of gorse. Uh, so we went in and we cleared all that gorse and have reopened the cap of the mound um, and opened up around the heather. Uh, this was quite amazing. We didn't, it, by no means did we create priority habitat in the first year, but it was amazing what poured into here in the first summer uh, and the life that already reacted to this change. It bounced back quickly. Unfortunately, the other thing that bounced back was a lot of gorse. Um, so we got in who scraped back to bare ground and also put in uh, some nesting habitat at the back. So if you can see at the back right hand side of that picture, uh, there's some graded bank in there. So that's another south facing bank. Um, we cut the contractor cut into it and has made these uh, slopes um, that I hope to see uh, mining bees using uh, in the summer. Really. Um, and this is what's quite interesting about these sites. They're so if you introduce that structural complexity, they can have a lot of the resources that our pollinators need within a very small area. So there'll be forage on site, there'll be nesting habitat, there'll be wintering habitat. Um, so these can be really special and really productive. This is quickly opening, hopping over to another site where we did some scrub removal, mainly silver birch removal, and how the seed bank responded pretty quickly. Um, so the following year, we started seeing small heather plants establishing, common century coming up, some bird's foot trefoil popped up as well. Um, so that was nice to see. There was no seeding there. It just it just came of its own, own accord. And this picture just shows uh, Langley Fields, which is a... Uh, local nature reserve, hoping to be designated by the end of this year, I think. And 
this shows exactly um, what I mean about that structural complexity. So you can see in this picture that it goes from bare ground through to short sward grassland that's quite wildflower rich, through to longer sward grassland, over into heathland, up into scrub, and then up into woodland. Um, and that interface of lots of different habitats is, is really um, important and uh, basically ensures a lot of uh, biodiversity. When working on these sites, a lot of the same rules apply as with um, species rich grassland restoration, the use of local seed and appropriate species. So actually these people here are volunteers and they're harvesting bird's foot trefoil, which we then sowed at Manor Road Pit Mound, which is just the neighboring site to this one. The reason we were harvesting that is the larval food plant of the dingy skipper, which is the butterfly that I'll talk about in a second. Volunteer effort is crucial. I'll talk about a little bit about that at the end. I've talked about structural complexity, a healthy toleration towards problem species. Um, yes, you're not going to get on top of them. Bramble, gorse, silver birch, and you don't want to get on top of them completely. They are uh, really important, lot uh, important cover, important nectar and pollen resources. Um, it's just applying that pressure to those sites. That's the, it's the pressure and the disturbance. Um, and we've tried to incorporate as much as we can, thinking about the other species present on these sites. So there's great crested newts. When we're doing our woodland work, we're ring barking and leaving a lot of standing deadwood. We're leaving habitat piles um, and high vernaculum for other species present on the sites. So the dingies are sometimes mistaken for a moth. Not the showiest of our supplies um, can easily be overlooked, and it is becoming brownfield sites are becoming a bit of a stronghold for this butterfly. It's quite fussy. It likes that bare ground for basking. It likes that short sward grassland with plenty of bird's foot trefoil. It also uses horseshoe vetch and greater bird's foot trefoil, but on our sites, it's common bird's foot trefoil that it lays its eggs on, and the caterpillars eat that as the um, larval food plant. They like that short sword grassland, short uh, wildflower rich, through into longer sword grassland where they roost and uh, look and seek cover and shelter. Um, so places like Langley Fields are absolutely perfect for it. And this is just off the MBN Atlas. You can see uh, a little snapshot of the records that I've pulled through. And um, this is Telford here. So you can see how Telford's chain of uh, brownfield sites are providing a really important resource for, for the dingy skipper. And they roughly follow the bee line. Um, so another reason for Telford and Region Council uh, to continue working and continue looking at their bee lines as a map of, of habitat connectivity, because this species um, will really benefit from it. And you can see the sites that we're working on uh, have quite a lot have, have established populations of the dingy skipper. We're also doing work on species rich grasslands. So this is dovetailing in with Telford Marine Council's changing approach to their mowing regimes. So we've got two large areas of grassland, um, Wombridge, um, which has been on a 16 mow and drop regime, and then Cocked Up Nature Reserve, which I think has been on slightly less, but still mow and drop. And what we're going to be doing here is organising the ground prep and organising local seed to go in. And with species rich grassland, I can't press this enough, local seed, as local seed as possible is really important. And this top picture here is a picture from one of Telford and Reekin Council's local nature reserves called Rough Park. Absolutely stunning uh, nature perennial meadow there. Um, these kind of subtle muted colors. You can see the purple of tufted vetch in there, the lighter pink of, um, of uh, red clover, but a lot of grass. And um, this is a site that we're gonna send a contractor in with a brush harvester uh, to harvest and clean that seed. And then we'll take it and sow it onto um, the other areas to make sure that we're using seed that's adapted to local conditions and adapted to, to local pollinators. The temptation often uh, is to create the bottom picture, uh, which we call sometimes call a pictorial meadow, and this is a mix of annual species. Uh, we would advise against it. Uh, one, these are annual plants, so they complete their cycle, life cycle in one year. They need bare ground to continue, so that's ground disturbance every year to make sure that they come through but also the use of chemicals is often employed to like create a clean seed bed. So that's, you know, glyphosating an area every single year. So we would advise against that. The other approach is to sometimes put them in in the first year of planting, because if you sow a native perennial meadow, 
often most of those flowers will need to put down their basil rosettes first and only flower in the second year. And because of the bare ground to establish them, a lot of people put annuals in. Unfortunately, this can lead to um, ideas from the general public that they see this beautiful display of colour in the first year. It dies off in the second year when that bare ground starts to disappear and they think the meadow has died when actually our native meadows are, are much more muted. Um, so I, we would advise against using those mixes and just putting really well designed, nice interpretation in and letting people know the expectation of what our native meadows look like and how they benefit wildlife. You know, they're quite grassy. A lot of grass is really good for cover and a, a larval food, food plant for many butterflies. Cut and collect is essential. A lot of the questions were around the expense of this, and this is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, once a year is great. If possible, two or three times can be really good, especially with some of the warmer winters we're having. Sometimes an early cut and collect can just really help establish particularly yellow rattles and annual and help it establish by knocking back that grass early in the year. But the challenges around that are expense. And we created um, some features like um, a pollinator garden in Dorley Town Park. And these are a real good opportunity to get a lot of what pollinators need in a very small space. So you can get your forage and your nectar and uh, pollen rich plants. You can have specialist nesting materials, so putting in plants like lamb's ear, where the wool carder bee uses the hairs to, to line its nest, and put in nesting habitat. So this area was a bit of an unloved area in the park. Uh, it was getting a bit of negative attention um, from local people and local councillors as, as to how it looked. And it just happened that we were working in that area at the same time. So we incorporated it into the project and um, planted it up with lots of... Uh, nectar rich flowers and we also put in that blue thing there is a little sand planter so it's full of sand it's got holes in the side it's got drilled logs in the side as well so it's providing nesting habitat for for solitary bees we saw absolutely loads of solitary bees when we were establishing this garden as well so um that has been provisioned for them this is it in the first summer during creation and then after it's been created. So it's a really attractive space that people can go into, have a look around um, and is provisioning a lot. It was built by the community. We, uh, Bug Life pull, pulled all the materials together, but the, we were helped by the school, the local friends of group, um, Telford's My Options group, which is working with adults with learning difficulties came and helped us. Um, yeah, it was a great community effort all pulled together. And it's wonderful now because it's being used as an educational resource for the school that's just over the road. Um, so we've done sessions with them. They came out and helped weed it, which is that pop picture. And it's just a way for them to engage with wildlife um, and, yeah, not feel scared of it. They can get right in there. There's bees all around them. They were studying them this summer and uh, it was a joy to watch, really. So it's a really lovely resource for them now. And what I will say is that none of this work would have, wouldn't have been possible without volunteers. So there's no grazing pressure on these brownfield sites. It's all people applying the pressure, basically volunteers coming in and simulating the role of, of herbivores. Um, so a big thank you to local businesses, local friends of groups. Uh, Rick Shaw on the end there has been instrumental in this project in, in getting volunteers. And so far we've had a total of 152 people come and help us um, with, uh, Heather seeding, um, raking, horse control and scrub control, and litter picking. Um, and yeah, a huge thank you to those people. And a big thanks to Telford and Reaking Council. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Kate. That's great. And uh, a very inspiring project. Um, and it's nice that it involves open mosaic habitats or brownfield habitats, um, as well as grassland creation. There's been some questions in the chat and the Q&A, but we'll deal with those at the end of this session. So next, it's my pleasure to announce Tanya St-Pierre, who will be talking to us about her role in gra as a grassland and pollinators team leader at the Cumbrian Wildlife Trust. So over to you, Tanya. Hi, uh, thank you, Kareem. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll just see if I can share my screen now. Here we go. Um, bear with me. It's, uh, 
Um, but hello everyone, I um, hope you can see this okay. My name is Tanya St. Pierre, uh, I'm Grassland Urban Pollination Team Leader, and what I plan to do today in my presentation is take you through some of the um, projects that we have run in Cumbria across the county um, since about 2018. So what I'll do is I'll just share the map with you. Um, so the map here you can see um, is a map of Cumbria and the blue lines highlighted show the B lines that were mapped. Now these B lines were mapped about 2015 and they were the best fit habitat areas. And Cumbria Wildlife Trust worked alongside Bug Life and Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre to look at these best fit uh, corridors um, as, as Bug Life was mapping the whole of, of the UK. So uh, as they worked really closely with Bug Life on this. Um, and that paved the way for our first pollinator project, if you like, and that was Get Cumbia Buzzing. And it was hugely successful. We were thrilled and delighted uh, with how much support we had across Cumbia uh, for the project. The project. It was an HLF project, so a Heritage Lottery funded project, but another partner was National Highways. And that's what I want to talk about a bit with you today. Um, because we actually pitched to the Environmental Designated Fund POT um, and um, we were successful in an £800,000 uh, bid for that, which uh, was matched with Health Lottery for the three-year project. Um, that was working with communities, but the aim really was to uh, work along the strategic road network of the A66. That, therefore, on this map, you can see Penrith across to Workington, which is on the coast just below Mary. Sorry, Port. Tanya. Um, yep. Can you just make sure your mic is turned up? It's a little bit muffled, apparently. Right. I'll just actually. I just better. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Nice and loud. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll take my uh, earbuds out. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully you can hear me clearly now, and hopefully the dog doesn't bark. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, so we we worked on the A66, the strategic road work, mostly for our work uh, for Get Cumbia Buzzing. And the map shows red dots, and that is the A66. It didn't quite follow uh, the Bug Life B lines, um, but obviously it was part of strategic road network. And the aim was to create uh, stepping stones, like Rachel said, really, for to allow our pollinators to disperse across uh, the landscape. Okay, so this. But this project, Get Cumbria Buzzing, ran to 2022. Um, and at the same time, we looked to deliver other pollinated projects and we were successful in uh, funding from Green Recovery Challenge Fund. Um, and we went on to deliver um, more work there. So <clears throat> first of all, the Get Cumbria Buzzing project, we looked at restoring about 115 hectares of habitat. Uh, so restoring and creating habitat specifically for pollinators. And then the Green Recovery uh, fund we really built on that and we looked at 58 sites and 170 hectares working with local authorities um so local councils but also church spaces um we work close with parish councils and we also work with farmers on that and we currently work on a project now uh, specifically with local authorities um to restore habitat on green spaces there so just to give you an overview about the work we're doing so going back to get cumbria buzzing um, the key aims there were to create uh, stepping stones of habitat along the bee lines. Um, and we uh, did this by identifying different verges. So first of all, we have death based studies where we looked at sites. We worked closely with Cumbria Biodiversity Data Centre um, to look at different habitats, but also work closely with national highways to identify verge sites. And we looked at about 230 verge sites, which I actually went out and surveyed every single one of. So that was through a development phase in 2018. <clears throat> um, we also wanted to look at innovative ideas around what we could do for road verges, um, you know, looking at how we could change cut and drop um, to uh, manage them better for short flowering lawns, uh, obviously creating um, native wildflower areas, meadows, uh, grassy banks, um, sunny banks, glades, tusky areas, areas uh, and, and scrub as well. So we had that mosaic of habitat that suited both uh, summer breeding grounds, but also overwintering refuges. OK, so do you Tanya, give you an idea? Yes. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just noticed in the chat that um, 
I think some people are struggling to see your slides. I don't know if you could put it in slideshow mode. Yeah, I can't actually do that. I don't know. Um, I don't know how can I can. Oh, hang on. Here we go. I just managed to move my bar. Right. Sorry about that, folks. Can you Great. all see now? Yeah. yeah. Apologies, apologies, apologies. <laughs> right. So hopefully you can see this better. So when I was surveying, um, a lot of you might familiar, be familiar with this site. Um, these are sites that have been quite abandoned, really. Um, so the, the management has sort of slipped. Um, and this is full soak grass, uh, so low in diversity in floral richness. Um, but you know, it's a good habitat in its own right for some species of butterfly uh, and other invertebrates. But we wanted to create a more diverse habitat. And this was went on for stretches along the A66 with uh, cow parsley and other sites that were just sort of single species dominated. Uh, so we wanted to, you know, have interventions that created wildflower rich or species rich habitats. Uh, no one, right, um, sorry, I just, and then also we had our classic uh, cut and drop areas, similar to, to others that have spoken today. So the aim of um, the work that we wanted to do was move species poor habitat uh, to species rich habitat. And we looked at using the UK HAB classification and working on uh, death of biodiversity 2.0 metric and the reason for this is because that aligned with national highways uh, way or, or their methodology okay we also wanted to look at flowering lawns as well and what we could do to these areas that previously had been just cut and dropped and we want to change the diversity uh, of those sites and we were lucky to work with ground control really good contractors um, um, that um, worked on behalf of national highways um, and at that time in 2019, um, it, we were, it was fantastic. They could introduce uh, machinery from the continent, such as things like robo cuts. Uh, we'd never seen those before. They'd never been used as far now in this country. So we were using this innovative equipment. Uh, we also used things like um, the Profi Hopper, Amazon Profi Hopper uh, for the work and small, smaller tractors, as well as um, larger um, machinery for the for the banks of the road verges, especially um, where we had dual carriageways. Um, so a wide range of machinery was used uh, for the for the project. Uh, and it was really exciting to see. And what we want to do was minimize impact for any road users. So a lot of the work was done at night too. And that's a nice picture of Blencaster in the background and a robo cut there. So the, the, the actual interventions, we could only do that within a year. So it was very quick in and out. Um, but what we had the opportunity to do after that was go back and monitor the sites. And I've been doing that now um, since 2020. So every summer I go out and monitor the sites, which is really invaluable because from the initial baseline surveys that I did in 2018 and 2019, we can actually look at those changes over time uh, in regards to the, the work that we've done. Similar to others, uh, we use local provenance species. We had, as part of the project, we had a nursery built in Gosling Syke in our northern office at Cumbria Wildlife Trust, and we grew our own species that reflected um, the, the Cumbrian wider landscape, mostly species rich upland or lowland hay meadows. So I went back and surveyed. Uh, we took a cohort of 25 sites, a quarter of the sites that we did work on. I did walkover botanical surveys using DEFA biodiversity metric and UK have. And then I also did uh, five uh, more in-depth phase two habitat surveys. Um, and I also recorded pollinator presence there. Interestingly, the first year, as you would expect, all the facilitated species such as yellow rat and eye bright um, were present in a lot of the sites. We were absolutely thrilled. We took eye bright from a local site um, for a seed from Icot Hill, which is one of our reserves, and we added it to a verge. We're really delighted to see that um, colonised in the first year. Um, some sites were incredibly rank. Um, so this site is a balancing pond area off of your carriageway in Dissington. And this is so it's off the net, slightly behind the, the road network, but it's still part of the National Highways network. And you can see here really rank grass on the top left. Uh, we went in and um, it we really hit it hard. Um, so having worked on a lot of meadow um, restoration 
um, activities in the past, I know you really do need to hit it hard if you want to make an impact. And you can see the third slide there on the sort of moving across the three, how hard we actually hit that site in terms of cutting and scarifying. Uh, and, and then um, we rolled it. Uh, we saw a quick succession of seed appearing. We seeded that site uh, with native wildflower seed. And if you carry on right round clockwise to the, the bottom left, you can see uh, the summer of July 2022 when we've got species such as Meadow Cranesville coming through. We also have Great Burnett, Bettany. So all those harder to establish species have come through via plug plants as well as seed. Okay, this is a, low, a short flowering lawn that um, we had some good success with. The top, uh, the sort of the bottom left is 2022, and it was just a sheet of bird's foot trefoil. We were so thrilled. Unfortunately, in 2021, um, it got inadvertently cut by the contractor, so we missed out a year then. But um, you can see post restoration how different it is and what an impact it makes and what provision it provides for pollinators. So another site here left is you know what you what you'd see generally uh, going up and down the the road at uh, the A66 as you're passing by, and then the bottom left is you know you're seeing the um, harder to establish species coming through. So um, really nice to see. Uh, another site um, you can see the colonisation of, of seedlings appearing on the left hand side after we'd gone in and done the work um, of, of seeding. Um, and the right hand side, it was just incredible haze of blues and purples from Meadow Cranesville. And we also had a lot of betony in this site and Devil's Bit Scabies appeared as well. So a real nice burst of colour in the summer. The species we didn't expect to see or hadn't uh, added as seed or plug plants were things like um, smooth ladies, ladies mantle, goat's beard um, and uh, twig blade. Uh, these just appeared as their own right as in response to the cutting. Um, and also we had profusions of orchids. So common spotted and early purple um, orchids would appear as well at sites that had previously they hadn't. So it's really thrilling to see. And just to say that um, overall, the analysis uh, of the monitoring showed that the work that we've done um, increased the abundance and diversity of the um, the species, the botanical species at the site. In terms of pollinator surveys, um, the pollinator provision in terms of habitat for feeding and breeding and overwintering, overwintering had also increased, but so had the number of pollinators recorded. Um, so basically, most most of those sites now are moving away from sort of a uh, well, moving towards an upland hay meadow from a um, sort of a, a much poorer classification of meadow or, or grassland, shall we say? What I did also was use the traffic light system, working with um, national highways. And these are these are all the 25 sites. And there's some sites there that are red. So these sites that aren't progressing as we'd hoped to um, using the biodiversity net gain model. So the reasons for that generally is that they haven't had proper ongoing management. So they've been missed out of the cutting regime for some reason, um, or they have been cut when they shouldn't have been. So that's the main reason for that. But there's lots of greens there that you can see that they're moving towards what we want, which is uh, you know sort of a condition of good. Um, and in its entirety, the whole area, which is about 31 hectares, has moved um, from 33 habitat units to 82 habitat units. So there's been a big increase there of biodiversity net gain. This is a 2.0 model, so it's not a current model. Um, so I'll just reiterate that. Um, uh, signage was really vital, actually. It was very good public, so public to understand what we're doing, um, but also for contractors um, to ensure that they did cut and they understand the reasons why um, they need to cut in such a way. All the cutting, I say, is just once a year, a cut and a collect. And that's really in terms of the sheer management and volume of um, the network, that's the, all that can be programmed. Um, and quickly, just to move on, well, just to say, actually, the National Highways have since um, moved on to the M6. So basically from Preston all the way up to Scottish borders, 
they have taken the Get Cumbria Buzzing model and they're working sort of across the area really to restore um, the channel, all the, the motorway verges up um, all the way up to, up to Scotland. Very quickly, this work that we've done through planting for pollinators, a lot of engagement work we've done the last three years, um, looking at ways we can uh, change local authority um, sites uh, and green spaces. Uh, we'll go in, do an initial survey, baseline survey. Uh, again, it's UK Hab. Um, we, we look at, we then work with community. We then look at site restoration plans, and then we produce a 10-year ongoing management site plan for those communities, for those local authorities, and for those parishes and churches. So successes have, uh, you can see, um, just sort of the years following um, intervention, and we, we're really thrilled with the results. Um, and Rachel spoke earlier about um, action plans for different localities and uh, different authorities. We are doing one in Cumbria and working with our local authorities for that, but also um, farmers, communities, individuals, and we have a pollinator action plan. And in terms of our local authorities, we lay out um, uh, a whole plan and, and advice here about the priorities that we consider and we work closely with both Westmoreland and Cumberland um, councils on how to deliver on this. And we also produce leaflets about um, what the local authorities are doing, uh, previously Cumbria Highways, now local authority highways, uh, the sort of best, um, best practices that we are delivering um, and advice of farmers and parish councils. We're also going to deliver a contract to conference training day and that's Thursday the 22nd of March. Um, so I'm hoping, well, the information that I've gathered today, which has been absolutely fantastic, hopefully I might be able to uh, uh, encourage a few speakers to come along to that event and share their what they're doing in their local authorities with Cumbrian local authorities here. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tanya. That was um, very inspirational. It's great to see the variety of habitats you've enhanced there. And interesting to note that it includes the sort of flowering lawn concept where you can have a, a shorter um, meadow, if you like, but with things like birds for trefoil and clovers so that they don't necessarily have to be the very long very end of season cut that we think of in terms of hay meadows you can still achieve a lot with a, a shorter area of grass than that. is that is that true from your perspective yes we did struggle a lot um because obviously there's a lot of areas that are cut and collected as cut and drop sorry so we had to select a specific management for those sites so it had to be uh cut and collected so that, that was the difference um but we achieved it as you can see from from the photograph so we're very thrilled with that um but that was only one site out of the whole network that we we were able to deliver that on so we would look to do more where possible going forward very good now they um we don't have long left unfortunately we have quite a few uh questions in the q a um summarize some of them um there are some questions concerned with how you actually go about changing the the view of um the local people but also the people you're working with in terms of the people managing the grasslands you know how do you go about changing this cultural view of how grasslands should look um and that's open to anyone any of our speakers to chip into can i just say that we did exactly what um was it jane um i think it was jane um uh did where we actually took our contractors out and we take national highways took national highways out to to sites and showed them you know sort of case by case the different sites of where they had done work and the difference it had made in terms of what on the ground it looked like and you can instantly see the the species diversity and um the whole range of species but also um these a lot of the sites were so much more alive with pollinators that was evident uh, and that in itself spoke volumes but um you know having talks like this that we're doing today as well and sharing experiences and best practice has really really helped and the contract today that we're hoping to do is again um, hoping to uh, to show 
that change that step change that we're making just to add to what you've said there is that as a council we've found that partners have been really really helpful to do this often um people public perception of a council is money saving um a negative um and um andrew from bug life in plymouth he did a great piece on our local um news show where he got the tv presenter to lie down in um one of our wildflower meadows live on tv to listen to the bugs um and um be in the grass so we find partners really helpful to 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 help bring uh, the public perception around and again, I've done that walk like you've described with councillors with uh, um, and with operational staff to show you just see the difference. If you if you've got a football pitch right next to a wild flat, wildlife meadow, just go to them both at the same time. And it's yeah, it's incredible. That's great. We, we have some questions about the cost as well. The investment in the cut and collect equipment, the possibility of getting um, teams of volunteers managing verges themselves and the possibility of getting people with scythes uh scything is becoming an important uh, a popular uh activity now people are getting trained up in scything um and often work parties of volunteers uh, are quite happy to go out with scything although health and safety could be an issue there um but what what you know in terms of the cost is a significant investment in cut and collect equipment needed are there alternatives like having uh, volunteers managing verges or or using parties of scything people um so if any of you want to start off on those lines of question um at the scale that we're doing it um volunteer parties would would take a lot more effort <laughs> a lot more time and cost to to um to coordinate so um our contractor is 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 incredible um we're really fortunate that we have this local farmer come composting business that's literally on our city boundary um who's worked closely with the council for years um they they see the benefit of working with us they they've set up some they do some free work for us in our uh, central park within the city where they've set up windrows composts um and they will leave the compost from Sorry, they'll leave the horizons that they cut in our central park um, there. But most of it they take back to their own facility where they have all sorts of clever bits of technology that removes um, litter and dog poo and all that type of stuff from the arising um, and goes into their compost system. And they have the whole process of turning it into a product that they can sell, therefore reducing the cost to us. Um, so that's we're really lucky in, in that case um the procurement that we put out we asked them to cost it per meter squared but i i've been trying to find it to answer your questions and i can't i'm sorry so i i i can't i can't tell you the cost um um but it's definitely cheaper for us as a council to use this contractor than for us to um invest in the right amount of material the right amount of um machinery and that's mostly because it has to happen at a very specific time so we would need multiples of tractors and balers and collectors and of all different sizes um to be able to get it done in the time frame whereas if it said say we could do it all year you'd only need one and you could do it on a cycle but because it has to be done at a, a specific time um we found it most cost effective for a contractor can I can I just add that um, yeah similar to Jane it's it's it, the, the local authorities here obviously national highways use contractors um, but the um, uh, Cumberland uh, local authority have actually invested in uh, Amazon profit hoppers so they're cut and collect machinery so that's a, a real step forward and we're really thrilled about that um, so they they do use that but they are experiencing similar things to Jane where you you know you've got quite a lot of green space. And the more sites that you um, that you have, the more you you know sort of you more, more the more equipment you need. So it is an investment. But what we have found with the cuttings, the risings, where possible, um, they're dropped on site. Um, we did try and look at having them removed uh, and made sort of into sort of a, a green um, or, or, or used for um, for biodigestive purposes, but um, 
um, like Jane said, we had difficulty because they were contaminated. So, but we are looking into that and ways that we can get around that. I know there, there is thinking that that can happen going forward. Um, I think that, oh, sorry. No, carry on, Kate. Um, I, I, I haven't really dealt with road verges, but I know there's a, um, some really good projects going on in Shropshire. And I think the National Trust and Restoring Shropshire's Verges project is starting a programme of looking at using a biodigester and what impact that will have on costs of, of cutting. But also Dorset Council, I think, did a really good case study on their verge management and how it reduced their costs and how over the years, once the yellow rattle establishes, actually reduces the grass um, cuttings by quite a lot. There's also a, a project in Ireland which has got some really good resources. I think it's just called Don't Mow, Let It Grow. Um, and they've got really good resources as well about how much the yellow rattlers reduce the grass growth and then how that impacts on how much is coming off the verges. Right, I'm hoping my dog will stay still. He's moving around noisily. Um, <laughs> just back on the on the cut and drop and cut and collect, there's, there's been conversations about that in the chat. Um, so in some instances, we need to cut and drop, but it is preferable wherever possible to cut and lift, of course, because you're keeping those nutrient levels low, which encourages the wildflowers. Also, dropping does smother them. So when we do drop on site, it's often good to sort of pile it in a sacrificial area. It's not a good term, but it's necessary sometimes. Um, there's also been mentioned in the chat of grazing, often not practical in a built up area, but whether a small nature reserve or fenced areas, or if you're using radio collars, um, grazing is another great way of, of keeping down those cuttings and the grazing animals can bring benefits as well, especially if there's no worming meds used, if it's like conservation grazing. Um, but yeah, wherever possible, we would want to cut and lift. Obviously, there's complications having the right machinery and the costs involved in that. Um, we have a Welsh event next week, a similar, very similar event, um, but the local authority in Denbyshire there are putting all their cuttings into green waste. So they tested it all and made sure there were no contaminants in it and that can go to their council green waste. They're not using that one metre strip because that's going to be more contaminated. Um, but yeah, there's various solutions there. Unfortunately, I'm aware that we've reached the... Uh end of our time limit. Rachel, what do you recommend? Should we should um, we yeah I, I think we can do another question or two if people are okay to stay. Have some people that have raised their hand. Yeah. Okay. So, so Linda Hickling has have your hand raised. Is that a is that a question you'd like to ask us live? Or is that oh well I was just <clears throat> I was just querying with um Kate, I mean, we, we're from um, the really south part of Shropshire, bordering on Worcestershire um, and, Her and North Herefordshire. And I noticed that she did mention in her um, presentation that the, the project covered <laughs> all of Shropshire and North Herefordshire, but nothing actually specifically was mentioned, really, apart from one sighting of the grayling, I think, around us. Um, so I'm I'm a we find that Shropshire Council is not terribly interactive with that kind of thing. Obviously, you're working with Telford and Rekin, which is slightly different. But have you had any dealings with Shropshire Council? Hello, Linda. Um, yeah, first off, I, I, I did. Our project does run through Shropshire and North Herefordshire. Um, and we're restoring 60 hectares within the bee lines, but it is, um, you know, site site based. As, site specific, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, as we go. So we're, we're, our partners are the National Trust. We worked with Herefordshire Meadows down in North Herefordshire with some private landowners and the National Trust down there. We're also working with a private landowner in North Shropshire and then and then Telford Marine Council. So it is quite localised the areas, um, but uh, as part of that, we also want to encourage people to add their projects to the bee line as well elsewhere in Shropshire. And obviously we're running, we've got webinars and, and such like. Um, I haven't worked with Shropshire Council as of yet. I have I have spoken to them and I know they're doing a lot of works, uh, a lot of work with other grassroots organizations. I'm sure you've heard of Restoring Shropshire's Virgin yes, project. Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. Um, and I have got a meeting actually with Shropshire Council um, and they're looking at some of uh, 
rover such like and that they wanted to have a chat about it so i have i have got a meeting coming up but i haven't had much interaction with them as of yet um i do know that as part of their local nature recovery uh strategy they were looking to incorporate bee lines um at a recent conference they were there and um i spoke up about bee lines and that, that they are keen to involve that so yes it's quite light touch my involvement with them so far but i think they are receptive to it yes Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll check out the bee lines on the map and everything and find out if we're sort of involved. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm aware that we're over time and some of you might have to leave to go to other things. So feel free to leave us, we won't be offended. Um, but we'll carry on for a few more minutes just because we have such a range of interesting questions. Um, so in the chat, I noticed that Bug Life have said they'd like to answer this question live. Ha, ha, uh, Rick Shaw says, have you used your surveys as baseline for biodiversity net gain or just for monitoring purposes? Um, who wants to answer that one from the panellists? I can, if you like. Um, we just used it for monitoring purposes. Biodiversity net gain, when we started out for national highways, wasn't actually um, set up then. Um, so that's just monitoring. But if anyone else here has done it for uh, biodiversity net game purposes, then yeah, over to you. <laughs> Some of our larger sites have been monitored beforehand for biodiversity net gain. Um, we have an old tip site, which is um, being being monitored and, and the credits will be saved up and sold. Sometimes a challenge to know the best method to use to monitor pollinators for purposes of either biodiversity net gain or, or monitoring a site. Um, I mean, Rachel, you've been looking at various approaches to that. Do you want to comment on that? Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> that is a very tricky question, really, because um, obviously it depends on the sort of skills you have available for doing that monitoring in terms of the level of data that you will get. Um, I know Tanya's actually been doing some pollinator monitoring, haven't you, on your sites? Um, but it, it is a great way to engage with the local community and get them observing what's using a site. So um, there are there are various methods, um, but you, yeah, you need to have people who can identify bumblebees and butterflies and things like that if you want to survey them. Um, there are fit counts, um, which the CEH have, not so much for monitoring, um, but for recording and for getting people to start learning to identify those different invertebrate groups. Um, insect timed counts isn't it the fit count. yeah flower insect timed count, which i think counts. aren't particularly useful for monitoring specific mm. sites they're more for a national scheme of monitoring abundance of pollinators yeah so you have to choose your techniques appropriately for your for what you want to get out of the the data exactly yeah tanya what what was it you were doing yes well um Specifically working for national highways, obviously we, we do have slight restrictions. Um, we used um, their monitoring protocol, which was based on monitoring um, motorways where actually ecologists only had about a minute to get out and survey uh, and then come back in again. So it was very, uh, <laughs> yeah, time focused, shall we say. So we did uh, walkover surveys um, uh, usually that two meter either side um, um, walkover surveys to record what uh, we saw basically. So, um, hoverflies, butterflies, moths, um, you know, all pollinator species um, within that minute walkover. So it's it's. But we we what we made we sure that we did was repeat it every single survey time. The only implications with that, of course, is the weather. Um, and interestingly, we had we were really um, hit with drought one summer, and that really seemed to. I had sort of nil recordings for a lot of sites because it was just too hot, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> um, so yeah, very very difficult to get a, a standardised monitoring um, system set up for pollinators. So if everyone anyone's got one, let me know. <laughs> it's a challenge, and it can either be too wet or too hot, depending. Mm. But if it's just right it's fine i suppose the main thing is that it's repeatable and you're using the same technique before and afterwards and under the same weather conditions um and ideally with the same people doing it but anyway we could go on for ages about monitoring so um i think we'll have one more question and then we really ought to close because i'm aware we're 10 minutes over time already um let's have another 
Rachel and, and the team, is there a question in the chat you would particularly like to answer? I think I Kate's asked to answer one live. Let's have a look. Kate, you said there's a question from Richard Army. Um, curious, it all has to be cut at the same time. If spread out across a longer period, wouldn't that result in a greater diversity of plant communities and avoid wide-scale loss of habitat at one time? Kate, would you like to answer that? Uh, I I flagged it just because I, I saw it and thought that's a really good question to raise and a good point uh, to say. And our work with um, land managers like like farmers and the National Trust, we build into our management plans uh, a rotation of, of cuts at different times of the year to allow later seeding species and always leaving a patch of flower rich habitat and rotating that each year so that no one location becomes coarse or rank. However, I think that can be uh, difficult um, for things like verges and such like when you're having to get contractors out and uh, to, to leave and rotate patches. And I think they tend to cut them later in the year anyway. So that provides a, a lot of cover. But yes, generally, if resources and time allow, we would advise to leave standing habitat wherever possible and move that around on a rotation. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add to that question. I just thought it was a good point to raise because, yeah, a, a cut and collect can be can be quite a, a brutal event. Um, so any way to mitigate against that, um, we do try to incorporate. Yeah, and I think as um, maybe mentioned earlier as well, we'd often leave little sections on rotation uncut each year as well. So you do have, you know, that refuge area and that overwintering area as well. Um, and even on a field by field basis, I guess if you have a little meadow um, in, and you're monitoring the species that are there, if you always cut it at exactly the same time every year, it's going to favour the same plants. So if it's, you know, dominated by knapweed, you're doing a very late cut and you want to support some of the other plants coming through, if you have the flexibility, which you probably don't as a local authority, but you may have on some sites, you might do an earlier cut one year um, and just change that cut a little bit. OK, so apologies to those of you who have raised your hands or asked questions um, where we haven't had time to answer them directly. Rachel, is there any uh, somebody commented that they would like some of the questions and answers made available? Is, is there a mechanism to do that or to provide further answers to any of these or? Not. I think Emily's our IT expert. <laughs> I'm not sure what happens to all the questions. I'm not either. I might just stay on the call and take some photos of the answers and then I can put in an email some of them. OK, thank you. And uh, once again, I would like to thank all of our speakers. Um, you've provided some really inspirational examples of how beelines can help local authorities and help um, increase diversity and um, Thank you, Rachel, for organising the session and, um, to, and to all the attendees. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you to all the attendees and all that all that you're doing. Keep keep up the good work. Yes, good luck. Add your projects to the beeline. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Cheers. Bye.